Hi, Kristen Atchison here, and this is our first lecture for our Introductory Psychology Hybrid course. And today we're talking about the prologue of the book. So as we talked about a little bit on the first day of class, psychology really is science. Um, we approach things using the scientific method, we approach it from scientific perspectives, um, and we really are looking to make cause and effect judgments based on true experiments. So psychologists, also known as scientists, um, we develop theories. Um, and theories are kind of these overarching umbrellas that help us organize our hypotheses. So a lot of times you'll have a theory about something, and under that theory we'll have lots and lots and lots of different research, um, different hypotheses and predictions about behavior, about thought, about the brain, depending on the theory. Um, and these will be tested through experimentation and other types of research methods that look at getting to these answers in really empirical ways. So we're not looking at... Um, the psychology of old, the introspection, how do you feel? We're really looking at this in more a of an objective perspective, more of a scientific perspective, um, than um, we kind of get a rap for in the in the media. So psychologists really are scientists, um, and we really. Um, keep pushing our field in a more and more scientific direction and really holding ourselves to very high scientific standards. So we also conduct research um, under these theories. So again, there'll be various different kinds of research studies, including experiments um, that we do to help us figure out if these theories about thought and behavior are actually true, if we actually have support for, for these things. And we answer questions about mental processes and behavior. Um, so we really look at these things in a myriad of different ways. We look at it um, all across the lifespan um, when we talk about um, development, when we talk about um, the, the kind of the groups of people that are under the psychology um, umbrella, we're talking about conception through death. Um, so we're really talking about the entire lifespan. And we wonder about how these things change, how these things are different, under what conditions do these behaviors and mental processes change. Um, with the addition of neuroscience and, and brain imaging techniques, um, we have a lot more ability to look at these things and tie behavior to really um, to areas of the brain, to different kinds of firing of neurons, and to really look at these things in, again, very, very um, objective ways. So hopefully you've already watched this. If not, please go to the NOVA website. Um, it is linked in D2L and watch the Monkey Nomics. It's a short video about the less secret life of scientists. And she happens to be a psychologist looking at um, primates um, and studying how their thoughts and behaviors um, can help us learn more about human thought and behavior. So again, please watch this video. It's very, very helpful. The modern de definition of psychology, and again, you watched and you had that video activity dealing with the history of psychology. The modern definition of psychology um, is the science of behavior and mental processes. Okay, so we, again, we have science in our, in our definition. Um, so we really are doing this from the scientific perspective. And a behavior is any action that can be observed or recorded. And a mental process is internal subjective experience inferred from behavior. And what really we're looking at in psychology is this kind of bi-directional relationship. When I say bi-directional, it's just what the arrows are pointing. Um, behavior dictates mental processes and mental processes dictates behavior. So those arrows are going both directions. They're bi-directional interaction. And they kind of can work in a loop. So behavior can affect mental processes, which can then change, what can then re-affect behavior. Um, so again, we have this bi-directional relationship. We don't have one necessarily only influencing the other, they both influence each other. And when we're looking at psychology and we're looking at the science of behavior and mental processes, we do so in through research. Um, and there's two broad types of research that we do in psychology. The first of which is basic research. Basic research tries to answer fundamental questions about the nature of behavior 
or mental processes. Um, so we're trying to get general information about a phenomenon. Um, we conduct this to gain knowledge and to further our scientific understanding of these processes and these behaviors. Um, and we, the practical use is not always foreseeable. So when people used to ask me when I was in graduate school, well, what are you studying? Um, and I would explain to them my dissertation and how we were looking at how four and six month old infants could categorize how we spoke to them. Um, they were all like, well, what, what, are you, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to make super babies? No. <laughs> there were, I was engaged in basic research. I was trying to see, get general information about how infants use how we talk to them and what role the face played in that to understand what we're saying before that they have words. Can they do this? Can they get meaning from us before they understand language? I wanted to understand about the phenomenon of infant-directed speech. Again, this is something we find in different languages across different cultures, and so there's some universal reality to it. So why? Why is it there? And so my basic research was conducted to gain knowledge about this phenomenon with the idea of uh, furthering science. I didn't have a use for it. Um, it was a question that we wanted answered and we wanted to know more about. Other examples, um, what facial information so like I was talking about for my dissertation, are infants using to categorize infant-directed speech? Another example would be how do listeners extract information from speech when competing sound sources are present? So how do you hear somebody in that cocktail party? How do you hear somebody when there's a lot of background noise? Um, there's not always a lot of use for that, um, but how does it happen is very, very interesting. Understanding the effect of being emotionally aroused on memory storage. So when you're highly emotionally aroused, it can change the memory process. And understanding that is an example of basic research. The other main category of research is applied research. And this is that addressed that practical problem. What is it good for is applied research. Um, and useful solutions are really kind of seen in the next couple of years as the hope, okay? So medical research, um, psych psychiatric treatments, all of these kinds of things are applied research. We have a goal. We're trying to fix something um, through that. And these are intended to improve the human condition. Now, the thing about applied research is we can't do applied research if we don't understand the phenomenon that we're studying. And that's where basic research and applied research are both really important. So to be able to have useful solutions and improve the human condition, we have to understand what it is that we're trying to fix. Um, and so that's where basic research is kind of that um, foundation that applied research stands on. So no, do I know what my dissertation had, what kind of, you know, application it has in terms of improving the human condition? No, but it's now part of the understanding of um, and this common scientific understanding of the topic of infant directed speech. And later on down the road, somebody might under, because they understand this better, be able to use it in an applied and helpful way. So again, broad uh, basic research is kind of that foundational research so we can understand the phenomenon. We can find out more about this thing. Um, and on top of that is applied research is built um, where we have these useful solutions. We have um, improvements in the human condition. Examples of applied research include... Um, things from neuroscience. Um, so can we stimulate one of the nerves um, to retrain the brain to ignore ringing in the ear? So if you have tinnitus, that ringing in the ears, that's really, really distracting. Can we fix that by retraining the brain to ignore that ringing in the ears? What are the benefits or risks of early child care on various areas of development? So when I was in graduate school, um, University of Texas at Dallas was one of the research sites um, for a national study on child care. And one of my um, my instruct one of my faculty one of the faculty members was in that data set, helped with that data set, collected data, um, interpreted data, um, and looked at how child care. 
affects these various areas of development. That clearly has a lot of application. And what they found was it didn't matter what kind of child care that you were necessarily getting, as long as it was really high quality child care. And that's very applicable, right? So that it doesn't matter, it's not staying at home is better or going to daycare is better, as long as either one of those environments are really good environments and really stimulating healthy environments for the child. Another example of applied research would be the psychological risks and challenges that intimacy creates for couples' relationships. So that's again, has applied nature to them. And sometimes it's not clear which is it is. It could be both applied and basic research. So some research doesn't fit nicely into those categories. An example would be from Elizabeth Loftus um, that the ability uh, for eyewitnesses to accurately perceive and remember criminal events. That's applied because it's very beneficial for trials and eyewitness testimony um, and the judicial system. But it's also basic in that it helps us better understand memory. It helps us revive our, revise our theories of memory and helps us understand these things better. So this is just kind of a start off to teach us that um, psychology really is science. Um, and we'll talk about this a lot more in chapter one when we start to talk about the different kinds of methodology um, that we use in psychological research.